want to explain a little bit about tuning the wind chime because um, it's actually such the most important part whether they look good at the end or not is one thing but if they don't sound good it won't matter how good they look they'll just sound horrible um, I have this set up now in a horizontal configuration uh, because you want to tune before you drill the mounting hole for the pin where it's hung from the string. Uh, you, you hang the tube at what's called node points. Node points are locations where there's no vibration whenever you hit the tube. Um, there's a lot of vibrations in the tube uh, but they won't occur at the node points which they occur at well, you take the overall length times 0.224, and that number is what you measured in, in from the end on each end, and mark it, and that's the node point. It's 22.4% for any length chime tube. It doesn't matter if it's shorter or long. Um, when you are tuning these, you have to keep in mind that you need to tune for the perceived frequency and not the fundamental frequency. Uh, that's especially true with these long tubes like this. Uh, the, the shorter, higher pitched wind chimes, a lot of times it's the, it's the same note. But for example, this tube here is the fundamental frequency is the C note, a low C, and the perceived note is F. Now that gets into a lot of technical stuff that I'm not going to get into right now. But uh, what I will say is the fundamental, the reason with these long tubes is you don't tune for the fundamental is uh, the fundamental note a lot of times is so low that you, the human ear has a hard time picking it up. Whereas the perceived notes are the ones, the loudest ones, that's easiest for a person to hear. So that's what you have to tune for. I know that sounds tricky and it actually is uh, a very involved subject. But fortunately there's a lot of information on the internet now by people who have studied this uh, over the years and they published this on the internet so you can find a lot of information on tubing lengths, thicknesses, um, you know, wall thicknesses, things of that nature uh, and material also. So you can get that information and cut these tubes to a close or general length and then start tuning from there. Once you have your tube suspended what you want to do is um, it, once you cut it a little bit oversized and suspend it you want to start trimming off the end until you bring it into tune. Now you can use a lot of different things for tuning a tube. You can use guitar or well what I mean is you can use a musical instrument or tuning forks. Um, oscilloscope is probably the best but not a lot of people have access to that I suppose. Um, there is an app for a for an Android now uh, called Sound Analyzer and I downloaded that to check the tubes after I was done. I didn't have it. I used a guitar for the, this set here but the Sound Analyzer is great if you want to simplify stuff. They'll tell you what the fundamental is and all the overtones so you can know exactly you can fine tune it to the exact frequency it's supposed to be. Okay let's take a look at the Sound Analyzer. Okay, as you can see here, I got uh, 129 would be the fundamental frequency, that's one on the left. Then you have 350, which is uh, one of the perceived frequencies, the perceived note would be F. 350, that's pretty much right on. The other perceived one is 681. It's saying the max hertz or max frequency is 687 though, which is still a little bit lower than uh, the F note should be, which is... 697 I believe um, and the other two off the top of my head I can't remember what notes they are but that just demonstrates what the the fundamental or resonating frequency of the tube is and the uh, perceived note
I'm testing the aerator. Good on this end, right? And a little bit on the other end. So as you can see, we have a problem. I hooked up another fitting for an air tube at the opposite end of the anodizing cell. And as you can see now, I have pretty even aeration throughout the entire length. Sometimes I'll get a dead, a dead aerator uh, in the middle, but I just turn up the PSI just a little bit. I'm only running a couple PSI in this. I'm running the T connection, two tubes. See that? And of course, over there is my my uh, die heater and ceiling cell. That's up to about 195 degrees right now. So I'm going to keep checking that. And this is just a test. I'm going to do a test run, see how well this is working. And hopefully it works out good. Anodizing uses low concentration sulfuric acid for the electrolyte. Uh, I am running an ag air agitator which bubbles air up around the part and that's used to dislodge hydrogen bubbles so you get a better formation of uh, your anodized layer. The problem with that is is when you bubble something through sulfuric acid it releases, I mean it evaporates into the air and then you get sulfuric acid fumes into your workshop airspace. Uh, you need to get rid of that because it's bad for your lungs first of all and second of all it rusts everything about instantly in your shop. So I come up with a very simple fume extractor. I had a, a boat bilge blower laying around for another project you know from a few years ago. It's just a 12 volt axial fan setup that is used to take um, fumes out of the hull of the boat. Now I hooked up an adapter, duct taped it on onto an inch and a quarter barb fitting. That's just your standard sh uh, shop vac hose. And then my fume extraction hood that goes on top of the anodizing cell. This has a inch and a quarter fitting on it too. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put this outside, hook this up and this will suck the air outside. Here's my anodizing cell in operation. You really can't see much uh, because of the fume shroud, but inside there is an aluminum tube, and it is the cathode, uh, the, or it's the anode. The cathode is the black lead hooked to that silver plate on the side. It is building up a, uh, an anodic film. Okay, here's the power supply. It's set to constant current right now. I have it set to 3.9 amps. And the voltage uh, started out at 8.5 and is working its way up to the peak anodic resistance. That'll take about an hour and a half. Once that happens, I'll shut it off and take the tube out and rinse it, then run it in the dye bath.
to show you a close up of these chimes. They turned out pretty decent. Here's the top. The only thing I wish is the top of this turned out really nice, but these things are so long you really can't see the top. Um, the top actually turned out exceptionally nice. Unfortunately, no one will ever see it. But uh, these are anodized and sealed and waxed. Here's the black walnut striker. You can see there I put three wraps of black electrical tape around that. Uh, it sounded nice just with the hard wood, but it was very accentuated, very uh, sharp, striking sound. And the electrical tape helps to give it a more of a rich, uh, mellow sound. So I went with that. In the sail, sail here turned out nice this is also black walnut you can see this of course this uh, wind chimes from my mother and she likes hummingbirds so I had a uh, local wood shop that makes uh, custom woodworking I had them laser engrave these uh, designs on here and they turned out exceptionally well so I will put a link in the description of where you can get this stuff done uh, you can contact her for this kind of work, she does very nice work. Um, the one other thing I did too is I put rubber O-rings around the bottom of the tubes because when it gets windy, tubes these tubes tend to smack together on the bottom. And if you do that enough, they'll start chipping each other, start chipping the coating off after a while. And the uh, O-rings don't affect the sound at all that I noticed. So this um, whole thing come together very nicely.